Hi to my friends and welcome back to more Let's Play Gran Turismo 2. This is Sky Hurricane 89. Hope you're having a super awesome blessed day and ready for more of this awesome racing adventure. And uh, in this part, we will actually have a little plan here to um, a car that I've been wanting to buy for a while that is not in Gran Turismo 1, or that's only in the arcade mode of Gran Turismo 1. But uh, this will be our first American car that we'll be buying. So let's go to Chevrolet here. Unfortunately, you could not use this for simulation mode in Gran Turismo 1, which is a shame. Uh, but it is quite expensive, almost 65,000 credits. But oh, it is awesome. May not quite be as good as the 69 Corvette Stingray, but uh, it should definitely do the trick. I think I'm going to go with that blue. Lindell Blue Metallic with Ermine White. Yeah, I think that's what we're going to go with. Let's read the information. 1967 was the last year for the classic knife edge style and used on the Corvette since 1963. By the way, uh, from Gran Turismo 3 onwards, um, well, I don't know what was in Gran Turismo 3, but like in Gran Turismo 4 onwards, for sure, 3 might have also had it. They didn't have the 67 Corvette. They had the 63 one, which uh, was quite a bit underpowered compared to this one. So sadly, uh, and I definitely wanted to pick this car for this game simply because of that reason. This is the only one, this is the only game that you can actually really use it in. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, the Stingrays and the I think the the Corvettes with this body styling and the following Gran Turismo's are not near as powerful. So it's kind of a shame, but anyway. It was available in Cooper convertible body styles and the suspension was independent all around. The engine choices ran for 300 horsepower versions of the 327 cubic inch, small block V8 through the L88 version of the 427 cubic inch, 7 liter V8 with 500 plus horsepower. Quite astounding. Only 20 L88s were sold at a high premium and only to racers. The regular L89 427 wasn't exactly underpowered with 435 horsepower at 5,800 RPMs and 460 stump pulling pound feet of torque at 4,000 RPMs. It was considerably lighter than previous big block V8 engines for much improved weight reduction and better road holding. Hold, holding. <laughs> Sky. The 427 sub 5 second 0 to 60 time is excellent even by today's standards. The 327 version was no slouch either. The hot version made 350 horsepower and 60 mile per hour came up in just over 6 seconds. The 67 Corvette had good cornering abilities by the standards of its day. And considering the size and quality of tires available at the time, four wheel disc brakes at a rarity at the time enabled it to stop well. The 67 Corvette combined style, performance, and refinement in a way rare for its day. So let's uh let's buy this baby here. And probably not gonna really do too much. I think I don't want to do suspension stuff, but power wise I'm not actually gonna do much tuning. But uh this will tune up quite nicely, but we will be able to do the Corvette manufacturer race with this. This will be nice and you can see the racing modification. Which we probably will end up doing because there's a racing. Um, Ooh, it's pretty darn cool, I gotta say. Yeah, there's a racing uh, modification race in the manufacturer events. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to afford all of this stuff I'm wanting to do. I should be able to. Because the horsepower upgrades are actually what's most expensive. Except for the weight reduction 3 and the suspension. I might not be able to afford racing transmission though, unfortunately. Yeah, we gotta have tires as well. Gotta have some good tires. I might even do, do the Seattle Endurance with this. Oh, y'all, we're about out of money. Yeah, I may actually end up having to do a little grinding, which I really don't like to do, but uh, we may end up having to do that. At least uh, prior to the next part. 
I don't think this will get a turbo or anything fancy like that, but uh, at 433 horsepower, that's quite significant. I know it'll get an A tune, but we're not going to put it on there. But yeah, 516. Really not as much as I was expecting. I think it still will break 600 horsepower, though, with everything on it. Just going to get our racing brakes, our sports brakes. And drive train. Definitely probably will need trans race racing transmission because this will kinda like I was talking about in the last part. I think we should be able to afford everything. Barely. Barely, barely. With just a little money to spare. Yeah, because that's not very expensive. But it is good for changing the performance. The handling and stuff. So yeah, we'll have just a little bit of money. Just a little bit left. Alrighty, well let's, let's try this now. Like I said, I will be saving the manufacturer events towards the end, probably. What are our FR challenges looking like? We had not really done any of these easy races. We could actually do this one. And this one, probably. But we're going to do the Muscle Car Cup. And you actually have to have, to have the International A license for this. And you can win some pretty cool cars by doing these. One thing to note. We're definitely going to want to change our transmission. Like I was telling you about in the last part. Look at the transmission. They put it on one. They will put it on one, two, or three for any car that you pick. And that will uh, that will make your car max out like 100, 110 miles per hour. Which is not going to be a good thing. You know, unless you're on a really, really short course with no straightaways. Definitely going to lower the ride height. And probably want to keep the front spring stronger because we don't want this to oversteer too easily. I'm actually going to keep them the same. Make the rebound a little stronger. And we should be good. I don't usually mess with camber or any of that stuff. The short transmission probably wouldn't have been too detrimental on this short course here, but... It'd still be detrimental. Well, I'm the only Corvette like mine. You can definitely tell the ride height's lowered. We're real low to the ground. Whoa. Keep in mind, we have uh, we have not changed the horsepower at all in this car. It still has the same amount of horsepower. And I really broke late on that. <laughs> and all honestly, we hadn't spent too much on this car. Because um, after I bought it, I think I'll add like 110,000 credits left. So, compared to what I spent on like the Mazda Protege, that's nothing. Yeah, this thing will definitely drift around the corners without you even necessarily wanting to. Yeah, I might actually need to make the front stronger or something. The front spring's a little stronger. That will discourage the oversteer. You are keeping up with me. That's kind of a slap in the face to my skill, isn't it? It's such a beautiful car. It's a shame I suck driving in this mode, so I won't even show it. We can kind of take our time, though. We got a pretty decent lead on them. Yeah, 
Yeah, for its day, it had good cornering. Yeah, say I'm starting to suck. I just cannot drive in that view. <laughs> I love how they're hitting the walls and stuff, and I think they've hit the walls more than I have. If I could have taken that a little faster. I honestly don't know this short course as good as the full course, because, of course, they dirt trace on the full course. But yeah, that was pretty fun. Pretty fun. We should do better on the next track, I would think. Plymouth Superbird, Plymouth Dodges, and the Shelby. Yeah, the Shelby GT350 is arguably one of the better missile cars in this game. Probably even better than the Corvette Stingray I got here. It's pretty good. It's very lightweight. And mine's actually pretty heavy. I don't know how much weight reduction got it down to, but I'm willing to bet it's still pretty heavy. Alright, so let's do the next race. Just a cruising along here. Cruising along, cruising along. Let's do Seattle Circuit. The full thing. Yeah, interesting, it says Muscle Car Cup, and you'll always be racing these muscle cars. As you see, I didn't have to do much tuning at all to this. As uh, a matter of fact, I could have entered my protege in it, and it probably would have been even better, but I'm going to make this front a little stronger than the rear. So that it doesn't oversteer quite as vigorously. But yeah, you could enter any car you wanted to. You could even enter the 980 horsepower Escudo Pikes Peak, which is <laughs> extremely ridiculous how good it is in this game. Oh, there's my there's my twin. Got him a red one. I suppose it could be a shaky guy, I don't know. But ours accelerates better because of all the weight reduction. Apparently, they didn't do any tuning to that car. At least, not very much. Oh, wow. Corvette, you're wanting to oversteer so intensely. I kind of like it. <laughs> Yeah, this is the curve where the computers just really suck. Look at him slamming into that wall. That's <laughs> oh, so funny. They will hit pretty much all these walls. And we already... Say I told y'all it's better at the full course than than the short course, which I think they're actually worse at the full course. So it's either I'm better or they're worse, or it could be a little bit of both. Because uh, they do sure slam into the walls on this one. One thing about uh, controlling your oversteering with a car like this, feathering the throttle, it works wonders. It really does. Because this car actually uh, is quite eager to oversteer. I may have broke a little bit late. It still worked out. Yeah, feather, feather the throttle until your uh, tires aren't spinning. And then you can kind of accelerate full out after that. Works usually quite well. Whoa! Thought we talked about this spinning out thing, Corvette. Although you're really not doing too bad. I haven't compl I haven't completely let it get into a spin yet, but uh, it's wanting to. <laughs> Golly, we've just annihilated them. After only having a one second lead in the last race. I just realized I've kept it in this view the whole time. I don't know why, because I suck in that view. I 
I guess because I had so much confidence because they were so far behind. Yeah, I kind of like the oversteer. It's a, it kind of helps you turn into the corner well, and uh, you know if you let off the gas feather throttle, you can actually, you can achieve a pretty good cornering. You know, pretty good cornering speed. But yeah, I'd say we roasted them on that, wouldn't you? Two Cor two Camaros Z28s. Come on, what? Where is y'all's creativity? They had all the Plymouths in the last race, I guess. They could have chosen to play the GTX or something. Oh, these are all so beautiful. Both of the Camaros go last. I like the Camaro Z2869. Quite underpowered, though, compared to this and the other muscle cars. But it is a little lighter weight. So, makes up for it slightly. Alrighty, let's take on our final race here and then we'll see what our rewards are. I'm interested to see. Laguna Seca, the finale. And this probably will be the toughest one because you do have the corkscrew. So I can see how it would be easy to lose control with this car. I think we can manage though. So we see the Plymouth Superbird again and some Camaros. They love the Camaro for some reason. My goodness, they chose two in the last race and two in this race. I wonder if they'll both get fifth and sixth again like last time. Plymouth Cuda and Shelby G2350. You know I had to get this color, y'all. Sky blue, you know, for sky. It was just totally appropriate, you know. Oh, I love this car. It really actually does handle quite nicely. With the right settings and everything. Oh, yeah. Yet another uneventful race. I mean, I didn't even tune this car to the max. Just imagine if I bought the NA Tune Stage 3, you know. Which, when I do the endurance race, I might do that. I'm not sure. I mean, it would obviously be unnecessary, because well, I don't know. They might be a little faster for that one. And they don't just have old muscle cars either. They'll have newer ones, like the Shelby Series 1. And even the Viper stuff will be in it. Yeah, this is not near of a, near as much of a high speed track as Seattle is. Oh, I love Seattle. It might be my favorite track in this game. Very easily could be it and Grindelwald. Grindelwald was not used very much, unfortunately. I broke a little early there. The key to this track, though, to be successful around the corners, is uh, early braking. It really is. Early braking is essential. I suppose I could have made this. I hope I'm not boring y'all by completely killing the opposition like I am. I mean, I hope this is still mildly entertaining at least. I mean, I guess I could have chose worse tires, you know. But still, I figure they would be pretty easy to beat. But Seattle short course, they kept up pretty nicely, but the Coda got last. Coda, come on now. 
13 seconds. 16, 17, 17. I'm guessing that Cuda was probably spinning out a lot. <laughs> you know, just for kicks, I'm going to watch the replay. 26, golly. I want to see if they spun out on that corkscrew, because I guarantee you some of them did. Let's see our pretty car in action here. It is a beauty. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah, I like Laguna Seca. I believe it was the first real-life track introduced into the Gran Turismo series because up until this point, no track was real life. They were all fictional. And all of the original Gran Turismo 1 circuits were kept throughout the whole series except for Special Soldier Route 11, which uh, I only made another appearance in Gran Turismo 3. And it wasn't used near as much in that game. And they did modify it a little bit too. Look at me getting off the road like an idiot. All right, here's the corkscrew. Look at me handling it like a beast, man. Look at that. Let's see how well they do there. Uh, not so well. Uh, he didn't spin out. Just swerved a lot. I bet you it did spin out on last lap. Though. It's pretty funny. I'm sure y'all get to see that. The AI. They're so funny sometimes. I think, though, off screen, I may do one of the... When I do farm, I'm not going to farm on a race that I haven't already previously completed. So it won't be anything you're missing, you know. So I think I will go back to the Grand Valley and or the uh, Grand Touring Car Championship and redo one of those for a little extra money because we're going to be needing it. All right, and my friends, I'm here on Midfield Raceway doing the Grand Valley. Uh, I about spun out and lost my train of thoughts. But, uh, but yeah, we're doing the Touring Car Race on, the, on this uh and as you say, it's done pretty good. I don't know if this is... Same, seems like I might have done a little better with the Protégé, but I'm not actually sure. I don't remember exactly what time I got. But yeah, 165, that seems to be about the max of this car with with the uh, transmission set on 11. But uh, yeah, we did quite well. So that should we should be able to sell that car and and win some money for some more tuning that we'll need to do for future championships. Because I am going to try to show off, you know, many cars I can. Which uh, I'll be showing off a lot anyway because of the manufacturer races. Yep, that was pretty nice. Pretty nice. So let's see what we'll be winning for all the muscle car races. I think we also want another Unicia GX GTR, which is really, really nice, but unfortunately, I'm going to sell it for the money. Sorry, baby. Let's sell you. And let's see. Dodge. Dodge can be first. Dodge can be the first American mate that I have. Or I could put Chevrolet first. Yeah, I think I am. Just, you know, the C comes before D. Not that my Japanese makes are in order. I'm sure they're not. But uh, we want a PT Spider for the first race. Which was the Seattle Short Course. Which is actually pretty nice. We can use that for the mid-engine rear-wheel drive championship. Which may be what we actually do. We could also use it for the convertible car championship. Otherwise, there won't be very many things we could enter this in. There is no manufacturer race for it. And we want a Cobra for the Seattle full course. Which also happens to be a 1967 model. 
Oh, that's a good car right there, y'all. And it's a lot lighter than my Corvette, I think. 2354 with no weight reduction. Let's see what our Corvette is. 3020 with stage 3 weight reduction. It's still super duper heavy. Oh my goodness. Of course, nothing on the Aston Martin, but, uh, but yeah, it's still super heavy, Lord. Of course, with the weight reduction, that'd bring it below 3,000 pounds. And then we won the Phaeton. The Phaeton. Which, uh, is super, super, uh, heavy as well. Let's look at the information on this thing. Let's, I'm not gonna read this to all of y'all. Um, you know, if you wish to read it, you can pause it and, and, uh, do it, you know, read it yourself, but, but uh, it's pretty cool looking. Uh, Ultra Luxor cars of the 1930s. Popular. Yeah, it does. Uh, it does look like it has a uh, historic touch to it. <laughs> the chassis features fully independent suspension, similar to that of the Dodge Viper. The front engine rear drive design. The fight. Phaeton has a unique 5.4 liter, 425 horsepower V12 engine in the tradition of the cars that inspired it. The Chrysler Phaeton is a machine for fast touring and extreme comfort. So this might be what we use for the luxury sedan cup, but uh, it might be too powerful. We probably wouldn't do much tuning to it. At the very least, we would put racing soft tires on it so we could compete handling-wise with our opposition. But uh, let's look at the information for the Cobra. Many pretenders, but only one original. Exactly. 348 were built from 1965 to 1967. Replicas are bound today. The 427 Cobra is legendary and for good reason. Yeah, uh, this, this car was replicated a lot. Of course, you know, they weren't the same as the original. Its chassis and suspension were based on those of considerably less powerful car designed years before. It worked remarkably well with the lightweight 289 cubic inch V8, but by the mid-1960s, the small block Cobra had run into a performance wall. Daytona Coupe was created to improve on the Cobra Roadster's barn door aerodynamics and was a very successful race car, helping Shelby to win the World Manufacturers Championship in the GT category. But the Daytona Coupes were hand-built and not suited to mass production. The other solution was more power. Mm. Pretty interesting. It'll lay rubber past 100 miles per hour. Despite the unaerodynamic shape, 175 mile per hour plus was easily obtainable. Handling and braking were in keeping with the power and speed potential. <laughs> yeah, we'll probably use that for something. And the PT Spider. Pronto, the word behind PT means quickly. <laughs> the PT Cruiser. <laughs> oh, those are actually some pretty cool little cars, I gotta say. Unique, very unique looking. Not very powerful, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, they were really designed for being more practical than powerful. Track for stability. Fast looks are not misleading. A 200 horsepower supercharged engine mounted transversely behind the passenger compartment drives the rear wheels through the same five-speed gearbox as is used in the Neon's ACR racing package. But it's uh, much better than the Neon, I'd say. Which we will be showing off the Neon, too. Something to look forward to, I know. Hmm. Yep, we'll be... We may actually use some of these in the next part, my friend. So, I do hope to see y'all there. We may do some of the front engine rear wheel drive mid-engine rear-wheel drive and the and the uh, convertible car trophy we may do some of those 
So I hope to see y'all there. This is Sky Hurricane 89 signing out. Hope you have a super awesome blessed day. And as always, stay awesome. Goodbye, y'all.